expect awe-inspiring landscapes, remarkable wildlife, and a couple of humans worth mentioning too, Tanya Data and Emika Anono. Here we go in Explore the Rift Valley. Our journey starts in Djibouti at Lake Asal. It's one of the hottest and most inhospitable places on Earth. So this is the lowest point in the Rift Valley. It's actually the lowest point in the whole of Africa. Right here, we're more than 150 meters below sea level. Temperatures here can exceed 50 degrees centigrade. This land looks prehistoric. It feels like it's hardly changed since the Rift Valley was formed 25 million years ago. Africa's Rift Valley stretches 2,300 miles from Mozambique to the former French colony of Djibouti at the narrow mouth of the Red Sea. It's an arid, barren country, with much of the largely Muslim population living in sprawling shanty towns. But its strategic position, next to some of the world's most important shipping lanes, means this tiny country has found itself part of a global struggle. I joined up with French anti-terror commandos in Djibouti's harbour. Great fear is of suicide attacks against boats in this region. Just on the other side of the Red Sea, in Yemen a few years ago, there was an attack on an American warship, and the great concern is that something similar could happen here. The attack by Al-Qaeda terrorists on the USS Cole left 17 American sailors dead. The warship was rammed by suicide bombers in a boat packed with high explosives. They've spotted a suspect boat and they're heading out to intercept it. So they pull alongside it, identifying it as a threat. And this one's actually boarding it to pull out the fuel. Wow. There wasn't much messing around there. Now, this is only a training mission, of course, but they take it very seriously because the threat is very real. The French, the old colonial power, have been here for more than a hundred years. But Djibouti's strategic position has encouraged the arrival of the real superpower. Welcome to America's main military outpost in Africa, Camp Lamonia, the first of a series of US bases planned for the continent. Master Sergeant Stanley Parker showed me around. When you were told you were being deployed to Djibouti, had you, had you heard of the place? I mean, never heard of Djibouti ever. Um, actually, I had to go to the map and find where it was. And when I told family and friends that I was being deployed to Djibouti, they, they asked, actually said, you're kidding me, J your booty? You know? <laughs> and I, I was like, I was taken back, I was like, it, it, it became the running joke, he's going right. to your booty. <laughs> this base, home to several thousand troops, feels like a piece of America. Look at the size of this. Almost everything here has been imported from the States. Even the food in the Bob Hope galley. What have you got tonight? Tonight is seafood night. All right. So, you know, you'll get the uh, shrimp scampi, steamed shrimp. Uh, you'll have lobster tails on the uh, menu. You don't uh, have lobster do, tails. We do here. have a steak night. Last night we had a roast pig. They had a whole roast pig out here, um, head and all. It's almost like being on a cruise ship. You know? <laughs> 
But the base is actually a new home for AFRICOM, a controversial new US military command focused on Africa. Brigadier General Roosevelt Barfield says the job of AFRICOM is to win over the hearts and minds of Africans, particularly Muslims. We do a number of civil affairs activities where we go out and we assist with uh, building schools, uh, renovating schools, uh, building wells, but we have no design to do any type of military combat operations. And I'm just noticing on the front of the helicopters here, the 0901, the September the 11th attacks, never forget. Mm -hmm. Do you see your presence here as being an extension of the war on terror that's, that started after 9-11? Uh, of course it is, A absolutely. Uh, but we are on the end that prevent those types of conditions that permeates and makes people want to do extreme and just bad things. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The Americans say they have come in peace to help stabilize Africa, but large areas of this base are off limits, and U.S. Special Forces are thought to have launched raids against al-Qaeda in neighboring Somalia. Are we right to assume that you're running some sort of special operations from here as well? Not, not this particular task force. We, we don't do those things. So you're, you're the friendly face of the... We American are the friendly here. face. History is in the making here. And, uh, and the world is watching. Djibouti may now be hosting a major U.S. military base but it remains a country rife with social and economic problems. Along with poverty and lack of development, much of the population is gripped by an unusual drug epidemic. The guys behind me are chewing on cat or chat. It's a mild, but quite addictive amphetamine. And although it's legal here and across much of East Africa, its use in Djibouti has become completely endemic with about three out of four people regularly chewing it. The chat is imported from the highlands of neighboring Ethiopia. Tanya Data set out to investigate a drug problem that affects much of East Africa. Traditionally, this was a coffee growing region. Even the word coffee is thought to originate in Ethiopia from the medieval kingdom of Kaffa. But now, chat production is taking over the countryside. In the heart of chat country is Harar, a walled city dating back to the 16th century. This place is so atmospheric. Apart from the sewing machines, I don't reckon it's changed much in the past few centuries. It's even got its own private language, which is only spoken within these walls. Adare. It's a vibrant city, with nearly 400 shop-lined alleyways packed inside its walls. Harar is also a hub for trading chat. Are you buying this chat for your own use? Yeah, I, I use it for work, yes. yes. Okay, is this enough for one week or enough for one day? <laughs> one day. We'd just begun filming when the police arrived. Although it's legal, chat is still controversial and some Ethiopians didn't seem happy for us to be here. Chat contains cathinone, a stimulant that keeps users awake, suppresses hunger, and causes a feeling of euphoria. It's addictive and has been linked to severe heart problems and psychosis. This is Harar's Christian Orthodox Church. Christians have worshipped in Ethiopia since the 4th century AD. Preachers here publicly condemn the use of chat. 
We believe that chat deadens the mind and weakens the body. So as a church, we will not hold back from teaching that chat is harmful. We have a saying here that when users don't get their chat on time, they suffer from what we call arara. Then they can only focus on getting their next fix. They can't do anything else. The chat trade is lucrative business. We managed to negotiate access to a chat warehouse. It's 2.30 a.m. and a truck has arrived carrying 300 kilos of freshly harvested chat. This is quite a surreal scene actually. The guys in green seem to be distributing the chat to the workers who are seated all around the hall. And a lot of these people were asleep when I came in, but they've now snapped into life and they're sorting through the chat quite energetically. A lot of them seem to be chewing it as well. The warehouse owner, Segal Mohammed, explained the production process. We remove the tough leaves, the ones which would be hard to chew, and we also remove any leaves which are blackened or damaged. This warehouse may look basic, but there are huge profits to be made here. Chat is one of Ethiopia's biggest export crops. This business alone turns over more than a million dollars a year. Chat is hugely popular here, as widespread as coffee or alcohol in the West. Most users maintain it's harmless, but if the health effects are as serious as some argue, this habit could be a lot more dangerous for the people of the Rift than they realize. The Rift Valley marks the meeting point of three of the great plates that form the Earth's crust. It cuts right through Ethiopia, and at its heart lies the capital, Addis Ababa. Ethiopia is now a democracy, but it still struggles with the legacy of a brutal communist dictator. General Mengistu was in power for 17 years until he was overthrown in 1991. Corruption, mismanagement and underinvestment means the infrastructure of Ethiopia is among the worst in Africa. I've been wanting to come to Ethiopia for years. This is actually my first time in Addis. My first impressions, I would say it's uh, very, very friendly, a bit dusty, a little bit smelly and overwhelmingly young. More than half Ethiopia's population of around 80 million is under 20. But the sheer size of this young, growing population has frequently tipped the country into crisis. I headed to the Oromaya region of southern Ethiopia. <laughs> this part of the country is completely different to the dry and arid images of Ethiopia that the world usually sees. This is a fertile area dotted with farms much of their produce for export to the West. Yet famines are still striking Ethiopia, and even here, people still go hungry. This is an emergency feeding center set up by humanitarian charity Médecins Sans Frontières. Medics here use a simple color-coded bracelet to identify severely malnourished children. <laughs> 